What is the perspective of like a CEO? Hello, everyone. You're tuned in to the EO Inspire podcast series. We call it Pour Out What's Special because we pour our guests their favorite drink and they pour out their passions for us. Every entrepreneur has their story to tell, and we're here to listen and learn from their experiences. Yeah, okay. I think we're good to go. Okay. okay. So thank you for being here, Alvin. Mm-hmm. I'll just explain it to you again since I already did last time, but we're basically shooting a podcast for EO. Okay. And the objective that I was tasked with was inspiring core values. All right. And the best way I felt I could do that is maybe getting into the head of like entrepreneurs and EO. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to do five different podcasts to okay. represent each and every EO core value. We're doing trust and respect. And I think that you're the perfect person for this. Gee. If I may brag about you a little bit, not for you, more for me, but you're considered one of the best CEOs. I think the best CEO in the Philippines and one of the best CEOs in Asia. So I think there's a lot we can learn from you. This is me cringing. I know, I know it's hard, but I think the, the viewers would love to hear that. So that being said, um, I think there's, like, like I said, a lot we can learn from you. And also, maybe before we learn more about you and touch on that theme of trust and respect, maybe we can talk more about DNL, sure. since you act as the CEO of DNL. Sure. So DNL is a company, I think, that is primarily B2B. Mm-hmm. And right. most of us, like business people, of course, know your company, mm-hmm. publicly listed. But a lot of consumers maybe don't. Sure. But they're probably consuming your products. Sure. So tell us more about DNL. So uh, DNL is a company that uses innovation and R&D to make ingredients that other companies use, uh, primarily in food ingredients, as well as raw materials for chemicals. So this could be plastics, paints. Um, we're pretty, we're as old economy as it gets, very brick and mortar. Uh, but I think it's fair to say a lot of things that you see um, in the supermarket, the grocery, or around the house, uh, anything that's made from material or anything you eat, uh, if it's made in the Philippines, uh, there is a good chance that part of that product or the packaging for that product, uh, part of it could have come from us. Very cool. Including my dog's dog food. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> which Vitality. we just found out this yes. morning, Vitality. Mm-hmm. And including, um, of course, Lauren, which mm-hmm. is the MCT oil. Mm-hmm. So you, I, if I was, I was looking at the company, there's six, at least pub, the public companies, mm-hmm. there's six major companies. And mm-hmm. it's kind of split, like you said, between food chemicals, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. And then oleo chemicals. Can you tell us more? So, what is an oleo chemical okay. exactly? Um, so that's a technical term. But in layman's terms, it just means chemicals that are made from vegetable oils Mm -hmm. or a natural source. The traditional chemicals, uh, what would be called petrochemicals, uh, that would come from oil, gas, and coal, or a mix of these three. Um, And uh, there is another branch of chemistry where you would use vegetable oils and other natural sustainable sources uh, and that would be where other chemicals comes from very cool so that's like the oleo chemicals and there's also uh, so that's more food right not necessarily so actually um wh- vegetable oils would normally be used in food oleo chemicals would now be used more as substitutes of where chemicals are normally used mm. so for example um, I remember growing up, I was always told by my parents, uh, shampoo or soap, uh, make sure you rinse it off very well. Make sure you don't, you know, swallow it. Uh, because it, shampoo, soap, traditionally is made from petrochemicals, the active ingredient. Mm. Uh, but now you have uh, these organic shampoos or soaps and detergents where the active ingredient is a... Uh, vegetable oil, not a chemical. Mm. And uh, so uh, there's more interest, especially after the pandemic started. uh, And that's probably something we're going to see more of. Yeah, I've heard that too. That like, um, first of all, you shouldn't even use too much shampoo to begin with. Like Mm -hmm. it's not. Mm -hmm. And then I think parabens, I always hear like parabens. Yeah, there's a lot of, right. right. What is a paraben? Is that like that chemical you're talking about? It's one of those, yeah. So there are a lot of these chemicals. um, So uh, there are a lot of uh, 
chemicals which are really harmful to people. Mm -hmm. um, some have been classified over time as even being carcinogenic or causing cancer. Oh no. Um, and so that's why over time we've always had uh, certain warnings about reducing things like lead or mm -hmm. cadmium uh, in everyday products uh, like toys or paint, yeah. for example. Um, and it's possible over time you will get uh, even more of these warnings. Yeah. Uh, so that's why that movement towards the more natural mm -hmm. uh, sources or raw materials, uh, it, it's it's gaining more popularity. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I ate some Play-Doh as a kid. <laughs> like, there you go. Good <laughs> so oils, We're still okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I think so. I don't know. It explains a lot. Uh, but that's just not necessarily food. And then there's like the packaging side too, right. I think. All mm -hmm. sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mostly B2B still, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All B2B. Okay. Yes. Very, very cool. Okay, so that's DNL in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Also, long-term relationships with some very major corporations people are familiar with. Right really long-standing relationships. I think you have like 30 plus years with Boysen or something. Right. Like um, a lot of our customers, uh, normally, the, the kind of products we make for our customers would normally be imported. Mm. Um, and what we would do is we, we would use our R&D facilities to come up with something that's locally made. Um, that really endears us to a lot of our customers mm -hmm. because it then means instead of having to be exposed to forex risk and waiting for the importation to come in, yeah. they have a local supplier. And the advantage of a local supplier is, of course, uh, because we have R&D facilities here, mm -hmm. we can tweak and improve the product for the customer. Um, and that really... Uh, uh, improves the loyalty uh, between the customer and us. Yeah, it's always wonderful when you have innovation happening in your country. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's DNL. Now can we talk a little bit more maybe about you? I mean, when okay. did you take over as CEO? You obviously have a second generation family. Owner. Yes, that's right. Uh, so I joined the family business in 1997 after my fin I finished my MBA. Um, and for a while, I was kind of just wondering what I could do for the business. And I'm sure <laughs> my dad and uncles were wondering the same thing. So I started as a management trainee and then over time worked my way, uh, became a finance officer, finance manager. Do you get any preferential treatment as a management trainee, would you say? <laughs> or is it really like, you know, you start at the bottom, that's part of the experience? Um, I would say I started pretty much at the bottom. Uh, my salary was, I think, so I finished my MBA in the States. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at that time my salary was even less than what an MBA from AIM would get. Yeah. You know, so, um, and uh, in terms of what, I wasn't doing much mm -hmm. in terms of tasks, but uh, there is in the Philippines what's called the COO phenomenon. Child of owner. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, the advantage is, uh, I get to meddle or put my nose into stuff that doesn't really uh, affect me or where I shouldn't be looking at, but, uh, but people talk to me. Mm -hmm. So that was an advantage. People were happy to welcome me and talk to me. Uh, part of it, I guess they were curious who I was. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it uh, was probably maybe there was some hope that if I could know what was going on with them, yeah. then maybe I could help them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that's kind of how it started. Uh, I started Before you became CEO, this mm -hmm. is like you got an insight and you got a perspective from these different departments you were at. But before CEO, you were CFO, right? That's right. You were on the, so you, from management training, you, you worked your way up towards like the finance? Correct. Finance hierarchy, I guess you could say? That's right. That's okay. right. Another thing that you mentioned, uh, you said a CEO... It's a completely different role from what you were doing when you were oh, CFO. Yeah. All right. And you said that you get the most or you derive the most utility or you, you enjoy really helping people and finding mm -hmm. like the issues where you're needed. Mm -hmm. Because as CEO, obviously, it's not you no longer have like a core responsibility like what you would in finance. Right. right? So you right. kind of have to navigate where you're needed in the company. Yes. So I really like that, that, that idea. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's probably good for you as you were working your way up. You said you're getting these different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So is that like, what, what would you say would be like your core responsibility as CEO other than trying to fill in where you're needed? Sure. Um, so I remember during my MBA, 
uh, one of the things, one of the advice I got, uh, five years after you finish your MBA, you'd wish you'd done more finance classes. And then 20 years after you finish your MBA, you'd wish you'd done more HR classes. Mm -hmm. um, and that is so true. Uh, probably 90% of what I'm doing now involves people. Mm -hmm. um, and that, of course, a CFO, um, people is an issue. Uh, not just the people that report to you, but how finance relates to the operations and the people, of course. But uh, as CEO, uh, it's really, a lot of it is about people. Yeah. Well, how much of it is about, because of course the inspiring piece is really important. Um, as CEO, how much of it is about vision and like that boldness of where you're going to take the company? Mm -hmm. Like do you put aside time to be like, okay, this is where the company needs to go. Like just to reflect big, big picture. Okay. So um, being in a family business uh, where in my case, our first gen, they have all retired uh, in a sense, as far as the uh, as far as the technical term or technical definition of being an employee, they have all retired. Mm -hmm. But f uh, in reality, they still spend a lot of time uh, in the company. They still go to the office every day, but half day. So they're in the office at seven a.m. They half leave day. at seven p.m. <laughs> half day is a twelve-hour right? day. Yep. Um, How old are they, by the way? So the eldest is 83. Oh my gosh, don't tell my dad yeah, this. My dad's 79. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're all, but they don't do a lot of the operational day-to-day -day stuff anymore. They mm -hmm. leave that to us, the second gen. Um, they're more involved in the um, big picture forest type, uh, you know, new ideas, concepts, uh, long-term plans, mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, so, so you could say in a way, uh, what you would see in a normal company is the transition between CEOs might take, you know, one or two years, mm -hmm. uh, in our case. So I've been CEO for six years, five, six years. Um, but in a lot of things I do, I still consult with our first gen. Um, they're my mentors. Uh, I get a lot of advice from them. Uh, because, you know, there's just so much going on um, and there's just so much knowledge they have that I need to learn from yeah. and I try to uh, get information from. I, I, I love the idea because like any family company, first of all, like they say, th there's the whole first generation, second generation, third generation curse. Um, you guys are in the second generation. Right. So I guess how, as a family business, you want all the charm of, you know, being a family business. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of advantages to that. You yes. can make decisions quickly. Right. Um, you can preserve certain values mm -hmm. and culture. But at the same time, maybe in, maybe it's entitlement or something. It prevents the company from professionalizing. Mm -hmm. So I think DNL is the perfect example of a company where we're able to maintain those values still. Yes. And still professionalize the company. We're trying. And I think it's great that, you know, a family member gets to step up as as a CEO, mm -hmm. I think in a lot of big companies, normally they would bring someone else if they're truly trying to professionalize. Mm -hmm. So how have you, how is the first and second gen, how have they been able to pass down those values to you? Because it's obviously working. Um, so in our case, uh, you could say that that uh, passing on of values started when we were very young. Um, so in our case, in our family, my dad and uncles, uh, they are very close, uh, five brothers, uh, no girls, so they don't have any sisters. And they grew up really close, uh, not only among themselves, but even when they had kids, mm -hmm. they would normally treat the kids of their brothers as if they were their own kids. And so I'm very close to my cousins. How it, many of them are there again? So we are 17, 17 in the second, in the second gen. gen. Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, I'm closer to my cousins than other people would be uh, in relation to their own siblings. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, it means that in the company, that level of communication, that level of trust is quite high. Mm -hmm. uh, and means the communication is much more open. The vulner vulnerability is there mm -hmm. uh, and the trust is there. Um, of course, the pressure is also there 
uh, but I would say it's a, it's a good balance. We have a good mix. What would you say is the pressure? Is that what, like, what motivates you to, to make, I guess, the founding patriarchs proud to pass on the company? Is it legacy? Is that like what you go after as CEO, second generation of this company? Um, I, w- I would say legacy is definitely important, but it's not something, you know, it's not something like above me, like repeating itself that this is what I need to do because of the legacy. Okay. Um, it is there, uh, but that would not be the overwhelming source of pressure. Mm-hmm. Uh, the source of pressure is really the company itself, the business, uh, where's the growth coming from, uh, how are our markets doing, how's our, how are our customers, yeah. uh, where are the comp- where's the competition, yeah. um, where can we expand, are we okay to do exports, um, yeah. so looking for opportunities, um, that is where I'm focused on more. I like that, it's like legacy and even profit should never be the objective, it's just a byproduct of doing the right thing. Something that my dad uh, told me a long time ago, uh, can't chase after money, mm-hmm. uh, it doesn't work, but uh, just go after basics, you know, grow the business, grow the margins, take care of your customers, make sure the markets are still healthy, um, and, and the profits will come. Yeah, my dad says the same thing. He says, your job is not to make money, your job is to, to do a good job. Money is a byproduct yeah. of doing a good job. Yes, I agree with that. He keeps repeating that to me, and I, I really love that it resonates with me. Mm-hmm. Okay, so on the, that's great, because on the, on the theme of trust and respect, it seems to be there of course, extremely important for a family business, Mm -hmm. especially with succession planning. Mm -hmm. What about now that we have this environment with COVID and everything? Mm -hmm. um, How, of course, there's a lot of employees, a lot of citizens who are really worried. How do you kind of make sure that you take care of your employees, inspire them, Mm. help them feel that they're still safe? Okay, Uh, so it has been a roller coaster, uh, which has not ended yet, looks like. Um, And, there are some things which we need the help of the government. So, for example, procuring vaccines. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, although we did end up buying some, uh, the a lot of that uh, has not arrived yet or is not available yet. So we had to rely on the LGUs to provide vaccines for us, which we're very thankful for. Mm-hmm. Currently, we are 97% vaccinated wow. across the whole company. How many employees is this? Uh, so yeah. that would be a total of. Uh, regular employees would be uh, plus the contractuals uh, over 2,000. Jeez, okay. So, so we're thankful that uh, it's, it's really only um, the people who medically uh, were uncertain about getting the vaccines uh, that are not vaccinated. Everyone else is pretty much vaccinated. So we're, we're very thankful for that. Um, we also invested a lot in doing uh, regular testing. So uh, when there are spikes or surges in COVID, mm-hmm. uh, we do as much as uh, twice a week. You did testing. antigen test? Antigen testing, yes. Yeah. I guess, yeah, because it's, it's really a tough time right now. And, and I can imagine that uh, your company being as large as, as it is, mm-hmm. like the, the overall impact, to the economy is going to have an impact on your business naturally, yes. right? Yes. Less consumer spending if GDP mm-hmm. goes down. So what is the perspective of like a CEO of a, of a company like yours on the whole situation? Are you bullish that we'll recover? Is vaccinations, do you think, the answer? Because you hear Delta still ripping through mm-hmm. people that are fully vaccinated, mm-hmm. even with Pfizer or Moderna. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So how do you feel about it? So the benefit of being a company that's been around for almost 60 years is that we've gone through so many crises in the past. Um, And actually looking at uh, COVID now, compared to other crises in the past, definitely COVID is deadly in terms of health, in terms of uh, people getting sick. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the financial impact, uh, COVID actually is not as bad as some of the other crises we've had in the past. Um, you know, so everything from the oil crises in the 70s, mm. uh, what happened with Marcos leaving in the 80s, mm-hmm. and then the, so many coup d'etats under Corey, and then of course the Asian financial crisis. Um, you could say the Philippines is, just has been through so much that mm-hmm. a lot of businesses, a lot of people are 
in a way more resilient. A lot of people use that word, but I really think it does really capture uh, how Filipinos are and how Filipino businesses are. Um, so things don't look so good right now, but uh, what we've learned in the past, uh, the Philippines has survived so much in terms of crises before. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at how pandemics are, uh, everything from the Spanish flu, bubonic plague, uh, even SARS, you know, they wreaked havoc. Uh, and they were very deadly as well, but uh, over time they resolved themselves. And there were no, there was no benefit of having any vaccines back mm -hmm. then. Uh, but things eventually normalized over time. So, yeah. so we will survive this. I think so too. And you can never count human innovation out. Yeah. Right? We'll, right. we'll always find a way to kind of address the problem. Mm -hmm. I think so too. It's just harder for like some people, especially like the small businesses. Yeah. It's really yeah. hard for them, yes. you know, it's really, really, really hard for them. And, and I get it too, like a lot of them are frustrated with the government, but I mean, the government's just trying to mitigate the spread as much as they can too, yeah. because we don't have really necessarily the hospital space to accommodate mm -hmm. this huge peak in cases. Mm -hmm. But I was actually looking at like the number of cases and the number of deaths too. And even if like you took it from that perspective, it's like you have to weigh the the two problems, right? Because mm -hmm. there's the health problem, which is obvious. You look mm -hmm. at the number of people infected, the number of people that die from the virus. Mm -hmm. Then you look at the economic impact. Mm -hmm. And the economic impact seems pretty big. If you yes. lock down completely, yes. and like I mentioned before, you already have 80% or so of Filipinos living paycheck to paycheck right. pre-pandemic. Right. And then you have, you have unemployment go up to like 10%. Who mm -hmm. knows what the real number is? It's like, well, there's a lot of hungry people. That's right. That's right. And there's a lot of small businesses that can't be open and they can't That's employ right. people either. That's right. So it's a really tricky problem. I That's don't right. really know the answer to it. Yes. Um, but also what, what I learned from that is that if you are fortunate to have a business, it kind of like goes to show that you can never predict what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So if you would have been, if you could have been, and you could have afforded to have the discipline to maintain that war chest, that, mm -hmm. you know, that cash or whatever you can, you can preserve it yes. for times like this, which is, which I'm sure is going to change the financial planning of mm -hmm. a lot of businesses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So speaking of which, what, what, what's next for DNL? I know you guys have a large facility you're building mm -hmm. now. You're still able to move on past the pandemic, right? We're hoping to, so that's the thing that's occupying us the most uh, right now, COVID. Um, we want to increase our exports. So over the last two years, um, our exports have really saved us. Uh, we're in the process of uh, completing our large expansion in Batangas. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're spending a lot of money there. Uh, we've uh, recently, we've, we did our first bond offering, uh, which closed... Uh, couple of weeks ago nice. um, and so we're lucky to lock in financing at least uh, to pay for part of the plant um, and then just being ready for when the economy finally opens so maintaining relationships with customers um, continuing to do innovation it sounds like you're optimistic that's good to hear <laughs> I think uh, as a businessman you have no choice you really need to be optimistic yeah definitely yeah. Uh, what's what is your biggest export market by the way you said that you're, you're focusing on the export market um, it's mostly uh, for our food ingredients and then our oleochemicals chemicals as well as specialty plastics um, and they would be sold to uh, other manufacturers uh, mostly within Asia but we go out as far as uh, North America and Europe as well. Okay, very cool. It's always good when you hear because the Philippines has a trade deficit, right? We That's right. We import more than we export. So That's whenever right. you can create value in the Philippines mm -hmm. and export other markets, uh, it's good for the economy. Yes. I I'm hoping too that like Filipinos in general, because especially in the wine industry, mm -hmm. like there's no more, there's no worse industry where there's a colonial mentality than wine. Okay. Right. Right. Like there's this perspective or this attitude that if it's imported, it's better than if it's local. Okay. And so my dad always tells me that third world countries sometimes can remain third world countries because we export our, commod our like sugar at commodity prices. Right. And then we buy it back in the form of candy. Mm -hmm. And it's like, who's making the money in that transaction? Right. Uh, it's kind of relevant to trust and respect, but do you think there will ever be this shift where Filipinos will be proud of like local companies and things being produced. And then if you're exporting, will the perspective ever be that like it's a badge of honor to be made in the Philippines? 
We're hoping so. Um, so in our case, we used to import as much as 80% of our raw materials and export was maybe less than 10% of our mm -hmm. sales. Um, today, our uh, importation of raw materials is around 50%. And exports uh, has reached about a third of our sales. Wow. So we're trying to increase our exports and rely less on importations. And I believe that's something uh, that would benefit uh, you know, uh, us and, of course, the country as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what's, your, what's the biggest market? You mentioned the different countries you mm -hmm. export to, but what's, who's like the biggest importer of... Um, it's mostly just around Asia, okay. so manufacturers, uh, whether it's in China, in the US, Thailand, in the US would have some as well, mm -hmm. uh, but the US market, um, yeah, there would be some as well, and it is growing, definitely. Very, very, very cool. Okay, so on the on the topic of like being a leader, so we're diverting a little bit, mm -hmm. but I think that like uh, second gen like me. I'm a little bit younger than you, but we are a lot this, younger than me. <laughs> 34. <laughs> but like there, I see a very I'm old enough to be your dad. <laughs> I think so. um, there's like a different attitude on how to manage people, leadership styles, mm -hmm. right? And I would say that the first generation, at least my dad, has a very different management style than me. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like that whole, you know, I want to say the word hard ass, but I'm not sure if I'm able to say the word ass. Like you're like hard. Sure. And then... The other side is like you try to inspire, you try to build up. Mm -hmm. So what type of leader are you and what do you think is more effective for the Filipino people? Um, so having been in the company for over 20 years, I had a lot of opportunity to observe uh, my dad, my uncles and their leadership style. Um, I think I'm lucky in the sense that as far as uh, our first gen is concerned, their leadership style um, has been quite uh, inclusive. Uh, so, so yes, I've, I've heard and seen how, especially in Asian family businesses, how the older generation is. Um, I would say uh, in our case, our first gen, uh, they're much more inclusive. Uh, they rely on teamwork a lot more. I guess because it's five brothers that work together as a team. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just one guy doing it on his own. Um, so that has rubbed off on us second gen quite a lot. So we tend to uh, like working in teams as well. Mm -hmm. All 17 cousins are active, no. or 17 so, second gen are active. So out company. of 17, we are, I think 12 or 13 involved in the business now. Okay. Um, so there's a couple who are not involved, mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of us, two thirds. And one of the third gen. And as of a month ago, one of the third gen joined us as well. Okay, this will lead me to my next question. Mm -hmm. The first generation builds it, the second grows it, and mm -hmm. the third squanders it. So how do you make sure the third doesn't squander it? Um, so, so much more than uh, legacy, that would, that would probably be um, even more top of mind for us as a family. Uh, how to make sure that the second gen uh, absorbs a lot of the systems and principles and values from the first gen and how are we able to cascade this to the third gen mm -hmm. and to hopefully also implement the system so that this uh, cascading of values principles and systems continues on to the future generations as well yeah the most valuable thing you can pass on to the next generation is mm -hmm. values yep I That's completely right. agree with that. That's right. But easier said than done, I think. Oh, yeah. Because oh, everyone yeah. is their own person. That's right. Um, That's right. So you guys have a family constitution. Yes. I'm sure. Yes. And are you like pretty strict on it? You guys review it? You amend it if you need to? We, we review it. So we meet uh, once every th three months or four times a year uh, to discuss things, uh, among which is the family constitution and other things to do as far as... Um, the family's uh, businesses are concerned and mm -hmm. how the family is as well. Um, the Constitution was probably first done maybe 10 years ago, but I would say it's still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, you know, over time, we learn new things that we suddenly realize, oh, maybe that should be in the Constitution or maybe we should change some things in the Constitution. So that's, 
it's an ongoing process. Very cool. Okay, so that's great. It sounds like uh, I was asking like what what makes a family business really effective, and it's that you share those values. Mm -hmm. And when you share those values, I think clearly in your company, if you have a trust in every single family member that's working in the company, mm -hmm. I mean that's trust and respect for sure. Mm -hmm. That's an important value to your company. I think that's really helped your company grow. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, this is the, the last question. It's kind of silly, but I think it's interesting. Do you think trust is something that is earned, or do you think that it's something that should be given? Um, it's definitely earned. Uh, think about it, parents, too. Like Obviously, they are entitled to a certain amount of respect. Yeah, right? but you know, you see a lot of kids who don't respect their parents. Yeah. Uh, and so I think it's something that, uh, you know, for Asians um, where we are brought up to be, you know, naturally respectful to elders, respectful to our parents, um, we are taught to behave a certain way. Uh, but uh, whether or not the kids actually have that uh, trust and respect and love for the elders you know it's not something you can just force onto people um, and deep down I don't know if naturally it because naturally people are selfish right mm -hmm. people have pride people are envious right so um, concepts like trust and respect uh, may not naturally occur in people just it's just how people are naturally mm -hmm. so uh so i'm i'm on the camp that yes you you do have to earn it agreed agreed mm -hmm. okay alvin thank you so much for your time i really appreciate you coming back here i've learned a ton thanks for having me yeah thanks for being here i hope you guys enjoyed that uh stay tuned we're doing four more of these so thank you guys thank you bye, -bye. thank you alvin chris or, yeah yeah it's right thank you <laughs> <laughs>